Good afternoon. We're going to jump into a prompt start. We're a minute behind, and they gave us a 30-minute slot for a 90-minute conversation. <laughs> but we'll take it. I'm just excited that we're actually talking about library skills, because we talk about all of these initiatives, these exciting projects, but we never ask who's qualified to do it. And so it's time to finally have the conversation. And we're excited to be here with, with colleagues who have been doing a lot of this work within their organizations, um, breaking the news to a lot of our colleagues that though you may have signed up to manage books and information, your job is actually to manage people. Gotcha. <laughs> and so for those I haven't met, my name's Tony Zanders. I'm the founder and CEO at SkillType. I'm joined today by Keith Webster from Carnegie Mellon, Kareem Bugita from Stony Brook, and we want to talk to you about the topic by the name of to increase or decrease capacity, the what, how, and why of 21st century library skill development. I'll start us off today with some remarks after five years of working with libraries around the world on developing a data-driven skill strategy within their organizations. And the picture that I want to paint is that even though everyone's up in arms around the impact artificial intelligence will have on our lives, on our livelihoods, on our organizations, if we zoom out for a moment, every four or so years, we are in the same up in arms. Um, there's something new. Uh, if we look at this timeline, if, I'll try to read through it at a high level for those in the back. All the way back to 2004, when Web 1.0 was coming into the picture, and libraries weren't able to just count on patron counts coming through gates. But now all of a sudden we had to figure out a way to reach people that weren't physically coming in. This was very um, a deviation from how we traditionally conceived of the library and our work and the skills we needed to do our work. But now we can't imagine a library without a website. Um, the same goes for around the 2012 mark when most of our systems were now hosted in the cloud or on the way to be hosted in the cloud. We no longer own things. We were now licensing and subscribing to things. This changed the skills we needed to do our work. Uh, we needed to now negotiate with third parties to uh, figure out these subscriptions. And even 10 years later, we're now still doing that work with the big deal and managing open access initiatives. And same things around 2016, we know the social justice movement that swept the United States and the world. And this, again, all of a sudden changed our work. It changed how we work. It changed how we relate to other people. We're now needing to be trained in areas that, again, we didn't realize it was something we even signed up for. I won't say the, the, the word here next to 2020. Hopefully, we don't have to hear it much more. But the pandemic that swept the world moved our jobs to hybrid or remote. And all of a sudden, we have to reconceptualize how do we do our same job, but without the same tools. And so hopefully, you're starting to get a sense that even though now we're talking about generative artificial intelligence, we can't focus on the buzzword of today or the trend. We have to actually start to develop a framework for how do we decide what skills should we be developing and recruiting in our library and rethink the way that we do that. So going away from the what we're training on and how do we decide. And this is the work that we've been up to at SkillType for the past five years. And so before the pandemic, we gathered a group of nine libraries to ask this very same question. We've become so analytical now about managing our collection. We know every statistic almost, cost per use, how many clicks and downloads, so on and so forth. But it's about time we became as rigorous about our organizations. And that was really the vision, was to become sort of more rigorous with what it is that we do, how do we describe our work, how do we articulate that work to our stakeholders across campus, and no longer relying on human resources to do that bidding for us. Oftentimes, they don't know what the library does. Actually, they look at us as a peer to the facilities department or athletics. We're just a business unit that has to make sure we do things by the books. Aside from that, you're on your own. 
And so this is something we believe that must be insourced into the library. And as a library leader, your job is to manage people, and those people are going to be managing the information. So as I close up my remarks, I want to talk a bit about the skill type philosophy around this area. Even if you aren't using our software, this is something that can be adopted from a philosophy level. We can't, again, focus on the trend of the day, because in three years, there's going to be another trend that shakes up our job and changes what we do. First, it's important to develop a clear sense of what your library needs and to document this in a way that is visible to everyone. So remove information asymmetry. Don't let employees play a guessing game around what is it that are the priorities we have, because most folks aren't in the provost council meetings. Most folks are not in those committee meetings where decisions are made. So we need to become better at communicating those needs. We can't expect telepathy. That's not a skill we have yet on the platform. Next. It's one thing to know what that North Star is, but where are we today? What skills and capacity do we have right now? It's one thing to know everyone's job title. It's another thing to know uh, the sort of position description and the percentage breakdown, right? That's what HR tracks. But it's another thing to know who's capable of doing what on a Thursday morning, and is that information at the ready? Not just for me as a leader, but for the people actually doing the work. How do we sort of take the competencies we have and kind of expose that in a, in a, in a way that's accessible, um, again, Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. And lastly, put these two different data sets into a model that lets us see where the gap is. And so in this Venn diagram, you'll start to notice there is some overlap between what we need as an organization and what we have, but it's actually what we're missing that where the training needs to focus today. And so that's not how it happens traditionally. Traditionally, it's sort of a wild, wild west. People can raise their hand and say, I want to go to this conference or I want this workshop. And if you have budget left in your allocation, you know, you can go for it. But there's a more strategic way to go about this, especially during a day when there's a talent shortage. We may not get approved for the job posting that we want to get from HR. We may have to get in line behind athletics or admissions or another, another group. And so how do we control what we control, work with what we have, and focus that, that reskilling and upskilling effort in a more strategic way? And it's really about looking at that, that, that delta. And so that's the one message I have for folks today is to, again, not get distracted by the, the trend du jour, but to start to understand this is the 21st century. Every four years or so, there's going to be something that changes our job. And so we have to develop a new framework for, for describing our work and defining it um, that can sustain whatever the next trend's going to be, because there will be another. I'd like to hand things over to my colleague Keith for his remarks. OK, thank you, Tony. And I see what Cliff meant about being dazzled by the lights. Uh, it's impossible, despite your, your comments about the trend is sure to think about jobs and skills today without reflecting upon the long-run impact of technology. And whilst many of us have been talking about this for a couple of decades, the emergence of generative AI applications, and especially things like ChatGPT, has turned technology from a tool into potentially a virtual coworker. And this changes the nature of skills profoundly. And there were a few of us from Carnegie Mellon at an event in Seattle last week, and one of my colleagues, a professor from our College of Humanities and Social Sciences, I thought some, some things up really nicely. He, he said, I can carve nice sentences, but chat GPT can do it better. It can code better than me. My skills have lost value in the past year. And if you reflect upon that, it's really quite a, a profound way of thinking about things, and I can begin to tease out a, a couple of potential futures for the impact of AI on professional and knowledge-based work. The first is maybe a, a more efficient version of what we've had for some time. Professionals will use different types of AI to streamline and optimize their traditional ways of working, what the economists would describe as technology 
complementing their work. The second future is a different proposition. In this case, increasingly capable systems will take on more of the tasks that we associate with these traditional professional roles. And the economists here would talk about substitution. AI or its variant will substitute for professionals in their work. My sense is that over the next decade at least, we will see these be realized in parallel, but in the long run, I suspect the second of these two propositions will dominate. We will find new and more efficient ways to solve the sorts of problems that we traditionally were hired to solve in our professional roles. And many professionals think of their work as monolithic. We talk about jobs. We think top down, I do a job. And that encourages us to imagine that the only way that new technologies can affect the work of a professional is to substitute for their job in its entirety in a sudden and disruptive way. And many people talk about the impact of AI on our jobs. But maybe we need to think about this a little bit differently. We need to think about professional work being broken down into its composite tasks and activities, and then figuring out which of the tasks that exist in a professional's role are not terribly complex, they're relatively routine, and can be automated accordingly. And therefore, I think it's important to think bottom-up bottom up in terms of tasks rather than top-down in terms of jobs. Entire jobs will not disappear in an instant, but new technologies will change the sorts of tasks that people do in their work. Some tasks will still require our traditional skills, others will require different types of people or no people at all. I don't anticipate that technological change will lead to mass unemployment, but instead to substantial redeployment. There are abundant new roles to be done and abundant opportunities to identify skills that we can develop and work with. Fostering these new skills will be essential for institutions to thrive in the future, and that will require a shift in organizational culture, management philosophy, it will require us to support enhanced professional development and evolve our approaches to workforce recognition and career progression. Once complex technologies such as coding and analytics, web design and automation are now accessible to non-IT workers, I tried this at the weekend. I asked ChatGPT to write me some code for R to do some statistical analysis, and it did it in seconds. So it is really opening up opportunities for those who are not sophisticated IT experts to leverage technology. But few of us in our organizations have a programmatic approach to ensure that our employees can exploit these opportunities, and that is leading us to potentially competitive disadvantage. Digital technology initiatives and a focus on the workforce are the top two library priorities, I would argue. And the intersection of the two, talent and technology, is what is increasingly thought of as digital dexterity. As our operations become more digital, the digital aspects of most jobs are accelerating. And I think it's a safe bet that the importance of having the ambition and ability to use technology for better outcomes will continue to grow for everyone in our organizations. The combination of technology acumen, an open mindset, and agile behavior delivers the highest level of digital dexterity. And we know that individuals with high digital dexterity are more likely to launch and deliver innovative programs, initiatives, and services. There's a clear responsibility for those of us in leadership roles. We need to ensure that we recognize, reward, and encourage advanced levels of digital dexterity. We need to encourage skills development and data literacy. To do this, we have to allow and encourage every single employee to take the time to develop these skills. The sweeping changes in work models driven by the pandemic continue to have significant impact, as Tony already indicated. They've granted many of our colleagues more flexibility in where, when, and how much they work. And we've seen this drive greater effort, promote engagement, 
and it certainly helps us to attract and retain talent. The pandemic-driven shift, shift in work models was unexpected and sudden, and I'm sure it's going to have a permanent effect on skill strategies going forward. Amongst the trends that I'm seeing at the moment, um, you know, and these are, are trends that are in flight, and therefore the people in, in this room, people who are in a position to understand, influence, and drive the trends, already are aware of what's going on. Um, we're trying to work even faster to accelerate many aspects of our work to cope with growing demands, for example, to support open science, data curation, open, A, open AI as an opening AI, not the, the company. Um, we're leveraging hybrid work environments. We're automating processes where we can. And we are trying to think about how we will leverage AI, how we're going to use analytics to help our teams in our libraries, in our IT organizations, to meet our strategic directions. So from the perspective of, of that sort of big picture thinking, um, let me turn to how in our library we're thinking about these things. We recognize the importance of onboarding and continuing training, um, even using libguides. And Tony tells me that um, he can do it better for us than these libguides, which <laughs> those, uh, there are a number of people in this room who have worked for me or who work with me and they know my views on libguides. Um, <laughs> A critical thing is the investment in our people, and we want, firstly, to give everyone in our team that sense of agency, the chance to develop their skills. We give every single employee a personal professional development fund. This year, it's $2,500 to support their attendance at conferences, to pay for memberships or webinars or training activities. But this year, on top of that, we've set aside a separate fund for anyone who's pursuing training in AI, because we see that as so absolutely critical. We need to be ahead of the curve, not playing catch up. And this gives you a sense of how we communicate that to our teams. Uh, every week, um, our professional development coordinator sends out a newsletter of training opportunities, and again, a particular focus on AI, but we do recognize that we still do other things as well. Uh, during university breaks, we bring together our team. We, we close the library for a day, and the world hasn't stopped turning. We were able to get away with it. Um, th this is a, a sample program from the fall break in October, where we pulled together everyone for a morning of um, plenary sessions and hands-on experimentation, and then in the afternoon, some parallel sessions on different themes. Uh, Said, who I saw lurking around somewhere, ran a great hands-on session on generative AI. These were some sample questions that we encouraged people to try out. You know, we don't want this to be a complex, scary thing. You know, imagine writing a menu for a dinner party or planning a weekend in a city of your choice. These are the sorts of things we want to do to offer easy um, approaches into learning how generative AI can work. And I felt obliged in case Tony felt um, that I'd forgotten about skill type, that we are very pleased to partner with skill type. Um, some of my team are deeply engaged with the platform and we are encouraging everyone to reflect upon that. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Kareem to give you the Stony Brook version. Thank you, Keith and Tony. <clears throat> so I don't have slide, but I will put, uh, I'll create slide with the resources I'm gonna share with you today. Okay. Sorry? Oh. I mean. Uh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know who I am. So. <laughs> I'm going to start with a question, actually. There was a movie, a new movie. It was out just three days ago. Title is Leave the World Behind. Have you seen it? Netflix? You should. It's a great movie. Actually, it's produced by uh, Barack and Michelle Obama. And it has tons, tons of symbolism and clues. And I was seeing it in kind of skills-based lens. And you have 
it's a dystopian movie, by the way, kind of an apo apo apocalyptic movie around like an AI and other kind of cybersecurity and everything. But you see, like, how would you survive with skills, tech and life skills? Generation, millennial, Gen Z, boomers. It's very, very, very telling. So I encourage you to, to see this movie. Actually, it was filmed on Long Island, by the way, where I live, and it has really, really good scenery. So <laughs> come to Long Island. <laughs> I'm hurrying too, by the way. So <laughs> next item um, we had with, with, with Tony and the Sage Technologies, Matt Hayes. I think Matt Hayes is here. Uh, hi, Matt. So they, uh, Sage Technology did a great study around kind of uh, skills within the library, library world. And one thing was surprising to me is that the disconnect between library administrators and staff. So guess what was the top one library administrator's skill set that people need to develop? Keith, it was LibGuides. Seriously? <laughs> Staff was uh, kind of 10 or 12, including data, digital scholarship. That's embarrassing. Like how you see that disconnect, we're talking professional development, actually. Leaders need professional development more than staff. So, <clears throat> so what's gonna happen if we don't do upskilling? I shared with social media a study that uh, UPenn and NYU published it in March, but CNN invited them like a month ago around um, what's the impact of AI on, on jobs. Title is uh, How Will Language Modelers Like ChatGPT Affect Occupation in Industries? And library jobs were among the top 20. With teachers, Everyone who's working with creation, including historian and artist. But the top one is telemarketers, which is interesting. So why is that? This was the ChatGPT effect. Before, it was totally different. Before, like librarian teachers were like, oh, okay. I mean, there was a study seven or eight years ago where library were kind of, yeah, we survive 50%. No, it's more than 50%. So if we don't do what we should do, then what's going to happen? You know the results. Some trends, actually, uh, complementing uh, what Keith said. Um, one of the last LinkedIn report is that less remote jobs, which is interesting, uh, in terms of studies, research studies, peer review, they were planning like remote job will stay forever. No, it's not. That's interesting. So we're back to face-to-face. -to -face. And also the credentialing. In higher education, that's our bread and butter. We do credentialing. And now employers are not asking much. 30% of jobs don't require credentials anymore. They're doing skills-based hiring. That's the whole thing, our business. Our business has centuries. We do the same thing, credentialing, credentialing. Even though we try micro-credentialing, but now it's different game. And we're not up to that yet. In terms of uh, where I am now, Stony Brook University, and before Rhode Island, and also George Washington University, professional development was my top priority, no matter what. I never cut professional development budget. That's important because, oh, we can cut here and there. No, if you're really serious about the reskilling, upskilling, you maintain your budget no matter how. And actually, uh, upskilling is also we're almost finished with our strategic plan, and we have a whole section around that one. It's called reimagining the way we work. So. That's it, the last thing, actually, in terms of trust score, libraries have a high trust score with people. That's a good thing, so we need to capitalize on that. Thank you.
Yeah, I believe we have a few minutes for comments, questions. Keith and Karim, hey. Um, I'm kind of curious about, we talk about this in the profession that we need to do this once they're employed. But what are we, we're not talking about the deficit that's happening at the ALA accredited programs. Can you speak to that? Uh, I'll, I can start. Um, where do you want me to start? <laughs> um, there's about 63 uh, accredited iSchools in North America. And um, I guess I'll summarize my feedback just uh, with a, a presentation I saw at the Charleston conference with a panel of high school directors uh, a few uh, years ago. And the presentation was them describing the steps it took to update a curricula with a new topic or a new area. And 30 minutes were spent walking through the bureaucracy of changing the curricula with a new area of focus that everyone agrees we should be focusing on, but there were 12 discrete steps in votes that needed and in consensus that needed to be drawn just to get it into the course approved into the curriculum, let alone start to promote it and market it. Um, and that was my eye-opening moment that the infrastructure that exists today to determine what we should be training on in an official way uh, has become obsolete. Um, the pace at which uh, change is occurring uh, has now exceeded it. And so um, it's no one individual institution's fault. It's not ALA's or any person's fault. Um, we can give credit to the system and for what it did, but we can also acknowledge that things have changed uh, since then. I'll maybe say a couple of words, but I'll, I'll be diplomatic. 20-some uh, years ago, I led the development of the body of professional knowledge for the British version of the ALA, and that was even more bureaucratic than Tony just described, updating a curriculum in a university, which for those of us in universities, we understand how long that can be. I think it begins with the profession articulating what are the skills and competencies we require not tomorrow, but over the next 20, 30, 40 years. And I'm not sure that we completely have an articulate vision of that. Uh, so there are problems all around. And I do think that, that some of what I was saying about moving away from thinking about jobs and thinking about skills, and that maybe we, you know, we almost set to one side the notion of credentialing, and we think about us as employers developing the skills of our team. And you know, I, I do look at the curricula of library schools on both sides of the Atlantic, and I wonder, it, it, it's an easy thing to, to pick on, and I know I will, I will offend lots of people, but how many of tomorrow's professionals will ever practically catalog a book? You need to understand the intellectual foundations of information description and organization. But there is a gap between that and the practical skills that only a handful of people will require. So it, it, it's a very messy, complex thing. We need to move on, perhaps, from an obsession around accredited programs. And, and I don't just level that at librarianship. It's true of many professions. We need a risk assessment. I'm, not suggesting that physicians necessarily can just turn up with a knife and cut. <laughs> the risks there are much higher. We, we, we need to really take a, a sensitized risk management approach to the impact of professional practice going wrong and train accordingly. Sir. Maybe actually, I want to give time because we're almost over. Daniel, Thanks, Kareem. Um, a question related to the framing of this talk. Your talk, the panel is called to increase or decrease capacity, but I, I don't think much was discussed around the decreasing capacity. I was I'm wondering if somebody could clarify what that component of this was supposed to be. Sure. I think Keith just mentioned it, um, you know, around cataloging. Um, there are certain traditional functions within our org chart that 
Um, if you ask why do they still exist today, um, and again, I'm talking about the function on the org chart, not a person, just to draw the distinction. Um, and the answer will be some version of, well, we've always done this. Uh, we, we've done it this way. This is, this is what we do. Um, and so to increase or decrease capacity is really a, 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 a nod to um, you know, interrogating that question. Um, should we continue to do this because we always have? Should we do less of it? Should we do more of it? Should we outsource this to a third party vendor, which we've done with ILSs and, and, and library service platforms? Um, and, but not just allowing a third party to ask that question for us, but this is, this is the work of, of the library to make the decision prior to someone else making it on the library's behalf, whether at the state appropriation level or at the university level. Um, so that is a bit more context. So it's about prioritizing the skills, not decreasing the staffing. So just, just to clarify. Yes. Decreasing Thank you. staff should not have come across at all. I think everyone yeah, spoke quite, to quite increasing the, the funding, opposite. increasing uh, professional development and reskilling. Uh, it's more. It's less around how many people we need more, but what should we be doing? Um, less of what should we be doing more of? Although, to be fair, you did recognize earlier, not to, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but just the idea that given that there is less opportunities to staff, there is also a component where we need to be more efficient with the staffing and ensure that they have more skills amongst those we already have. I'm not arguing against you, but just to add some nuance to that. In fact, probably in favor of your argument. Thank you for the clarification. Just to add to... Um you know, whenever I got this question from staff always, you know, I've been doing AI for a while now, like, what's the impact? Are you going to fire us? I got this question literally because there is AI anxiety. And I will say, no. My goal is not to fire you guys. And even if I want, I can't. And it doesn't make sense at all. <laughs> yeah. You have to keep people we, we, or, or you centered. So... This is why upscaling and rescaling is extremely important. We won't, won't get more, more people, actually. There will be long-term, will be decrease in staffing because the, those kind of technician level will go slowly, slowly, with the exception of a special collection and museums. But we'll have few people, but like more experts and more expensive people. But in terms of, and we have this trend for like, for the last 30 years. It's going down, it's going down, it's not going to go up. And sometimes even when you have a job because you need, I'm hiring now and you have to sometimes combine two, three jobs to create one because AI is expensive. Data people are expensive. So that's the trend we're going. It's the same thing when we move it like from, in terms of collection management, from you know, print-based to the, to the e-side. So it, it's the same but on a larger scale. And let me just say, say briefly, um, I think that the, the allocation of resources in academic libraries has shifted and, and will continue to shift. We are, let's be candid, no longer the primary provider of scholarly content for our communities. And that gives us an opportunity steadily to adjust budget allocations from content to people. And over the past decade, we have increased our headcount in our libraries. We're spending more on salaries and on skills development because we are shifting from being a collections-based institution to being a skills and service-based institution. We are hiring more and more faculty in the libraries to collaborate with researchers around campus. That, that is our future business model. So rather than decreasing capacity, it's increasing capacity. And, I hope you'll agree with that and tell my provost because he keeps complaining about our growing headcount, but it's absolutely critical to the future of the academic information enterprise in a research university. And the Department of Labor estimates that there will be a 7% increase in information professionals by 2030, and they may seek to adjust that with, with, with artificial intelligence, but those are the latest numbers from the uh, census and from the Department of Labor's website. Any other questions? Uh, well, I think the people are voting that we, we're not out of time. <laughs> <laughs>
Hi, um, I'm Frances Malloy from Union College, which is a small liberal arts college in upstate New York. And <clears throat> I struggle with this whole staffing issue in it, because in I agree, I think that, you know, what I've been doing my whole career is skilling up people and, you know, turning staff positions into higher level positions for the past 40 years. And what I'm finding at a small liberal arts college is they, that my boss really doesn't understand that, um, that expertise, those various expertise, that it's not just, well, you have 27 staff, Francis, really? Can't somebody just shift over to you know, build your IR? No, it's a wholly, totally different skill set than teaching instruction. So I'm just curious if you have a report or somewhere that I can, like how do you, how do you explain that to your, your provost? Like is there a report out there or something that would help me just kind of say, here, read this, you know? Uh, there, there's an entire <laughs> literature review we can provide, um, but I'll, we are out of time and happy to, to connect offline. Uh, thanks everyone for your attention today.